So good afternoon, everyone. For those of you that don't know, the very few, my name is Cameron Williams, and I am principal at Lilly Media. Today, I'm going to be discussing a lot of the uh, the fallacies or urban legends of search engine optimization and. Uh, how it is something that is continuing to evolve over time and most people are doing deprecated techniques that uh, are not going to give any yield. So uh, to jump into things, a lot of people think the word SEO to be descriptive. It's S is in Sam, E is in Edward, O is in Oscar, not S is in Sam, C is in Charlie, O is in Oscar. That's something that people run into a lot. Um, is actually the art of exploitation at its best. So it's not wizardry, it's not black magic, it's not spell casting, it's not a basement full of nerds on a mouse wheel. It's, um, it is the art of moving up a website's ranking through uh, search engine results pages. So touching more briefly on that art of exploitation, in the past there have, many, there have been ma very many different techniques available to website owners where they can change their positioning, but over time people, technology, and methodology have all become more intelligent. So as I previously said, a lot of those previous techniques do not work. There is a right way to carry out these functions and a wrong way to carry out those functions. So we are going to touch base on that today. Um, one of the most frequently encountered urban legends of search engine optimization is, well, if I go out and I get all of these links, well, ultimately I'm going to be important, right? Wrong. So. The headmaster of search engine optimization, Google, has gotten very, very good at detecting the context of links, uh, the specificity of links, and whether or not the content being linked to or from has anything to do with where it is ultimately being pointed. So if you and your business make red slippers and you start talking about pink garbage bags, it's kind of hard to make a correlation, and that citation loses a lot of its value. So. Moving forward, try not to excessively gain a bunch of useless links. Um, I've heard suggestions in the past, go to Fiverr and get as many links as you can there, or go to open submission sites and say, hey, how many of these pages can I get pointing back to me? That is uh, most likely not going to work out to your benefit. Um, another common practice that is going to work to your detriment is that of directory submissions. Um, for some reason, it is very commonplace and well thought that if you go out and you find a bunch of sites that list sites within a particular category or industry, that's going to be good for you. Again, that's simply shooting for the wind and it just looks spammy in nature. If you were to go up to everyone in this room that you had never met before and you were to say, hi, my name's Cameron, I want you to endorse me and tell people how great I am, I probably would look at you like, I don't know you from Adam, why would I ever endorse you? So you really want to be looking at areas that not only have specificity to the industry that you're in, but also trusted sources that are going to validate you. Because if ever in the event that one of those directories gets blacklisted or it loses its authority within, uh, within the world of search engine optimization, then you absorb that same penalty. So just like um, President Clinton, I'm sure, is not held in the highest esteem, all of us, after his scandal, so just like reputations would work between commonplace human beings, reputations do exist amongst websites and the other websites that they point to as well. So be careful with directory submissions. Um, another urban legend that I would like to dispel today is that of the fact that if you get on social media channels, then magically, you know, Google's going to pick up your Twitter activity, your Facebook activity, they're going to start looking at all of the magical pins that you pin on Pinterest and every infographic that you paste to LinkedIn. That's not the case. That's actually a huge fallacy that is very, very, very commonly adopted. Now, personally, I prefer if you don't take my word for it. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Matt Cutts. Excuse me, Matt Cutts. He's the, uh, the head of spam at Google. His primary function within the company is to make search better and to interface with the public on how to effectively use Google's products and gain the most amount of agility from using their products. So I'm going to play 2 minutes and 14 seconds of this video, and then we'll move forward. Uh, just so that it's not coming out of my mouth, you can actually hear it from someone that's more of an expert than I am. That's what she said. <clears throat> Thank you for the assist, Eta. I'm going to get my fat head out of the way. Today we have a question from Ryan in Michigan. 
Ryan asks, are Facebook and Twitter signals part of the ranking algorithms? How much do they matter? Interesting question. So let's try to walk through this a little bit. Um, Facebook and Twitter uh, pages are treated like any other pages in our web index. And so if something you know, occurs on Twitter or occurs on Facebook and we're able to crawl it, then we can return that in our search results. But as far as doing special, specific work to sort of say, oh, you have this many followers on Twitter or this many likes on Facebook, to the best of my knowledge, we don't currently have any signals like that in our web search ranking algorithms. Now let me talk a little bit about why not. Um, we have to crawl the web in order to find pages on those two web properties. And um, we've had at least one experience where we were blocked from crawling for about a month and a half. And so the idea of doing a lot of special engineering work to try to extract some data from web pages when we might get blocked from being able to crawl those web pages in the future is something where the engineers would be a little bit leery about doing that. Um, it's also tricky because Google crawls the web, and as we crawl the web, we are sampling the web at finite periods of time. We're, we're crawling and fetching a particular web page. And so if we're fetching that particular web page, we know what it said at one point in time, but something on that page could change. Someone could change the relationship status, or someone could block a follower. And so it would be a little um, unfortunate if we tried to extract some data from the pages that we crawled and we later on found out that, for example, a, a wife had blocked an abusive husband or something like that, and just because we happened to crawl at the exact moment when those two profiles were linked, we started to return pages that we had crawled. So because we're sampling an imperfect web, we have to worry a lot about identity when identity is already hard. And so unless we were able to get s some way to solve that impasse where we had better information, that's another reason why the engineers would be a little bit wary or a little bit leery of trying to you know, extract data when that data might change and we wouldn't know it because we were only crawling the web. So moving forward from that and kind of breaking that down into layman's terms, um, just because you exist somewhere, again, going back to validation, a reputation, or an endorsement, just because a property like Facebook or Twitter is very, very substantiated within the internet community, it doesn't mean they're going to pass on their reputation to you. Um, now, on the software side of things, which is what most of, most of us are privy to here, when you're going and collecting data from a third party, um, a lot of times you have very little control as to what data you can collect from that third party. So everything that's being collected from these third party sites, um, Google is not always in control of. So the best way to make use of social media channels, if you are in fact trying to use them to impact your positioning within search engine results pages, would be to Focus on the content that you're creating. Really focus on creating a sense of community within those social media realms and finding the best way for you to drive traffic to a website. So the traffic portion will be important. If the users that you're working with are finding value with that content, then that element, individuals finding value in your content, can impact you for a better standing. But just being on social media channels is not going to give you a benefit of a doubt in any means. Um, then another place that I wanted to touch base on was any old website will do. Um, the web has become increasingly more aesthetic. Uh, it's become increasingly more organic, if you will. And a first impression is everything. So just a second ago, I was talking about providing value to a user and essentially looking for the best avenue to create engagement because Google rewards engaging content. So uh, just a few, uh, few rules of thumb to follow. When you're looking for ways to make best use of that website, think about the initial response that someone's going to have when they land on a page. Now, a lot of people don't think about the fact that majority of the content consumption on your website, people reading your content, sharing your content, viewing your content, going through it, is not going to take place on your main page. Your main page is kind of your welcome mat. It's how you get people interested and enticed and get them to move through the site. Your primary focus in a site should be, how can I display and house this content? What is the best way I can create engagement here? And how can I ultimately use this as a resource for someone else? So sometimes it's hard to think about being in the position of that third party, but you want to give them something that they are motivated to pass on. So don't just do the bare minimum. Do something that you think that other people will be proud of. 
Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is the evolution of technology. Things are continuously changing, and as a result of that, um, search engine optimization as an industry as a whole, as, as an art, is always changing with that. A couple months ago, I would have told you to get onto Google+, create a Google profile, get involved with authorship and publishing, and then now we're looking at the complete decimation of that product. It's been removed, it's been rolled out, they're disconnecting its services all across the internet and getting rid of that. That is a wave of the past. Just like links that once yielded much authority are now a thing of the past. So as the technology changes, you have to be able to keep up with what is currently ongoing. Um, talking more specifically about staying up to date with your website, staying up to date with the experience that you're creating, and staying up to date with uh, with the value that you're providing. I just want to play literally one minute of, of video here, so this one's not as long as the previous video. But it really goes back to what sort of experience are you creating here. I love this white screen. That wheel means progress. Um, really goes back to discussing the experience that you're creating and, and how much value comes with not only the experience, but the consumption of content. So we're going to play one minute of this. Today's question comes from Denmark. Mads asked, Hi Matt, do you think that search engine optimization is descriptive in the way it is used today? Do you think we need to call it something else? Boy, I, I can't resist the philosophy questions. This one's really fun. Um, a lot of the times when you, when you hear SEO, a lot of people get this very narrow blinder on and they start thinking link building. And, uh, and I, I think that limits the field and limits your imagination a little bit. It's almost like anything you're doing is making a great site, making sure that it's, it's accessible and crawlable, and then um, almost marketing it, let the world know about it. So it's a shame that search engine marketing historically refers to paid things like AdWords, because otherwise I think that would be a, a great way to view it. Um, you could also think about not search engine optimization, but search experience optimization. You know, would users like to see the snippet on the page? Once they land, do they convert well? Are they happy? You know, do they want to bookmark it, tell their friends about it, come back to it? All those kinds of questions. So I think there are... Okay, so what once worked does not necessarily work now. Um, we've actually seen a huge evolution in currently what is yielding results within the industry. Uh, most recently, Google's rolled out a product called My Business. Uh, they use their own set of signals that they've created from Google My Business. Um, and that's usually giving a yield of around 14 to 15% of overall authority from a website. Um, external location signals, something that I think is, is here to stay. It continues to gain prominence. Uh, Google's really starting to focus on locality and what different types of connections within an environment there are. So if you are in Chandler, Arizona, and you're looking for a groomer for your dog, they've gotten really good about returning local results. So locality is huge. Um, On-page signals, a couple things that we just went over. Are you providing value to the user? Is your content easy to consume? Is it easily shareable? Does it provide value? Does it stay on the subject matter that the user was initially searching for? Um, link signals, where they used to dominate a good two-thirds to half of this graph, have really, 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 really gone down in relevancy, under 20%, which is huge. Review signals, um, as I said before, it's not great to be on every directory that you can possibly find, but there are some directories like Yelp or Merchant Circle, depending upon your industry, um, that can really give you some good yield. Now, I talked previously about social signals. When I say social signals, I am not saying go create a bunch of social media accounts and just hope for the best. I'm saying, what mediums are you using within the social sphere to drive traffic to your website? How engaging is your content? Do people share or retweet or repin your posts? Things of that nature. Use it as a trafficking tool. Don't rely on it as a ranking tool. Um, and then lastly, um, behavioral signals. I'm going to go to another slide here in just a second to kind of touch more on this. But the entire process of search engine, excuse me, search engine optimization typically starts on what's called a search engine results page. So that's that list that you go to whenever you type something into Google, and then you get a bunch of results back. How people interact with your listing on that page is also going to give a great deal of weight to how you are ranked. Um, speaking of those particular types of pages, 
with the introduction of multiple different types of technology, you have to be able to be accessible within these different realms. So as I said before, things are continuously changing. Everyone was heavily endorsing and chattering, have you gone mobile? 67% of businesses still have not gone mobile. They have not gotten into responsive web design. The next big thing is smartwatches. Uh, they're starting to roll out their own browsers too, so the web could get infinitely even more smaller than what it is now. So just as a kind of a rule of thumb, try and see ahead of the curb, try and prepare for what's to come in the future. Um, people are continuously becoming smarter and smarter. So not only is the technology starting to be able to better articulate human interactions, what's desirable, what is undesirable, but people themselves have. As of earlier this month, October 2014, this is a heat map of one of those search engine results pages that I was previously talking about. You can really see where people are concentrating on their clicks and their mouse over. Does it look like this is as important as it used to be? Probably not. So if you were once heavily relying on pay-per-click advertising, maybe you should take another look into organic search, locality-based search, and responsive design so that across multiple devices you're maintaining a ranking and a level of importance. As you start to move down the page here, you can see that it becomes a ghost town. So positions one through six, most of the time positions one through four, that's really where your value is. And it's a bit of an arms race to get there, but realistically, all things are moving towards content and the importance of it. So, realistically, we've gone over some methods that don't work. We've gone over some evolutionary progress of the technology behind search engine optimization as well as the process behind search engine optimization. So, you know, what's next? Where do we go from here? What's working? What's not working? How can you possibly get ahead as a business owner and how can you stay relevant? So, at this point in time, I'm going to uh, turn the stage over to Eileen, who is our content strategy director. And she's going to talk about an effective process for uh, content curation and how it can impact your positioning in search. All right, so content um, and content strategy. Imperfect words, we're looking for better words. They're kind of boring words. In fact, people who work in content strategy don't even like that <laughs> as a term. But it's basically um, taking the material about your business, your mission statement, um, and developing it, making it available, archiving it, um, managing when and how it's posted, who writes it, um, and you know, what are the future topics that you're going to look at, and uh, keeping an eye on trends. So this is the, the perfect circle for developing content, and often people thinking, are thinking writing, and they're also panicking. I hated writing in school, so I'm going to hate writing for my website. We're not talking about that as far as content goes. In fact, sometimes con the best content could be actually photographs. It could be infographics. It could be a mathematical formula. So uh, content is not just writing. But we come in with you're listening to the people who you want to reach. That seems like a no-brainer, but often people come up with, oh my god, I have 50,000 photos that I want to share, and so let's come on right there. Well, maybe those people don't really want to see 50,000 photos. Maybe they want tips on how to take better photos. It, it really just depends on what it is you want people to do. Do you want, want people to buy a camera, or do you want people to buy your book about photography? And that's... Uh, they're intersecting audiences, but they are different audiences. Uh, so the the content wheel, uh, content strategy wheel would go: um, listen to your buyers, develop your personas, decide on your themes and topics, create your content, promote your content, measure and evaluate, repurpose the content. So, for instance, you do uh, a little vlog. Well, a vlog is also um, transcribed into a, a blog. It's a photograph of you actually doing the vlog, it is then uh, a podcast when you strip out the audio. And then back up to here, we ask our audience, did they like that? Did we evaluate um, how they responded to it? And then we do it, then we go back through the wheel again. 
So editorial planning, that seems like so last century. Think about a, a bunch of people sitting in an office. I like to think of uh, Clark Kent and Lois Lane sitting in their office at you know, the Daily Planet, and they're deciding on uh, who's going to write what. And of course, you know, Clark always gets assigned to puppies, and uh, Lois gets to work in the war zone, right? And that never works out. Uh, but I wanted to point out, um, this is a poster from uh, World War II. It was uh, developed to be displayed in factories uh, around the nation, which was actually asking people to make your suggestions. Not only it is vital and patriotic to make your suggestions to make things better in the factory. So this is also true of content strategy because you don't know who among your team is going to know what the next trend is. Uh, they might spot it before you do. So every suggestion is ideas. Uh, <laughs> this emphasizes thinking. I just thought that thinking was part of breathing, but believe it or not, sometimes you have to ask people to think. So one way to start um, your strategy is to just think, what does a reporter ask? And it's the, the four W's. Um, who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, so I was talking to Ita, and Ita says, I have all this great content. And of course he does. And he says, but I never write it down, and I never think about what I'm going to write down. I said, well, actually, you could do it right now. Um, Ita deals with every different kind of speaker there is. People who are really good at it, people who are professionals at it, people who suck at it, people who are frightened. And he hands them a mic uh, every Wednesday and sets them up and gives them really brief advice. You're going to be fine. No, you're pretty. No, your butt looks great in that. Uh, and that is a post. So how does he, how, how does he approach writing it? Um, I, handed a mic, I handed a mic to Eileen. Um, I told her she's going to be just fine. This is what she works at. Um, it, it was during brown bags. In fact, I give advice to lots of different speakers. So that speaks to his mission, which is to reach people who need uh, video and audio for their um, business presentations presented through the web. And so people would feel more comfortable with him saying, oh, well, he's dealt with all of these different kinds of people. So it speaks to his mission and also what he's doing um, right where, right immediately. So he could tweet it out right now. I would say Eileen is one of my most nervous speakers, but we did just fine. And I deal with lots of different kinds of speakers. Content me, uh, contact me to do your business video today. And so this is um, Harper's Bazaar magazine. When we talk about an editorial calendar, I often think of fashion because it's the same all the time. Oh no, you say there are new trends in fashion, there are new colors in fashion, there are new designers, but the calendar is always the same. They're always one season ahead of time. They always do this special at this time of the year. Uh, so it's different people and different trends and different contacts but it's the same strategy year in and year out. So in some ways, it's actually easier when we watch the sort of the chaos, especially in social media with uh, design weeks, but still it is a controlled kind of chaos. So chances are you actually have a, a seasonal loop in your business. Um, it's certainly we can see that in food, in events, but um, suppose, let's see, you are a Mars explorer. OK, great. There's the funding cycle. So you've got to get people excited about it so that they write their congressperson so that they increase the funding so that you get funding. And then you go through your cycle of design and launch. So, all right? so even they have a, a, a definable cycle. Something that I like about this particular illustration about <laughs> how to do a, a, a strategy or a campaign is that people get caught up in, oh, what do I do on Facebook? What do I do on Twitter? What am I doing? Right? Oh, I need Pinterest. I have to have Pinterest. What about Ello? I'm frightened. There's so many. So these are the leaves. You know, Facebook is a leaf. Podcasting is a leaf. They provide nourishment for the tree. They're the thing that you notice most often in a tree. Well, what's most important is without the trunk and the branches and the stems providing food, then these things will not bloom and, and come out. So it's really not about the particular tool. It's really about what is your mission, who are the people that you're trying to reach. Notice these things can die off 
but if you have enough of them, it can still nourish the tree. And then they give feedback to where's your audience going, right? So let's say that you were a, a your professional photographer. Um, and maybe about five years ago, you didn't even think of Pinterest. Oh, that's for crafters. Well, sorry, my friend, Pinterest is for photographers now. This looks like a brain, doesn't it? But actually, it's a, it's a map of uh, interactions with brands from the internet. When we talk about organic search, what we're really talking about are relationships. So in business, we're supposed to be very rational. We can measure this, we can measure that, but it, what it really is is about how people feel about how they interact with a, a business, with a brand, with a personality. So, for instance, a lot of people are annoyed with um, Guy Kawasaki because they sense that he's not really engaged with them. He feels like a marketing company. And so they've moved on to other people who feel like, more like people who are talking to them, even though they might be marketing companies or, or have a back end, but they're just more clever about the, the voice. Um, how about Coca-Cola? So there are people who choose Coke and Pepsi, and they'll argue all the time about, oh, well, it tastes different. Truly, we just know that it's sugar water, okay? We're all hummingbirds and it's just sugar water. But people have a relationship with Coca-Cola because they think about the context in which they're drinking it. I, I always drink Coca-Cola when I'm sad and alone, or I always drink Coca-Cola when I'm together at a, a barbecue or something like that. So when, we, when we're really talking about brand participation, we are talking about those uh, emotional engagements. And quite often people are talking about, so how do I get people to like the things that I put on Facebook and to visit my restaurant and to keep me in business? And what we're talking about is a community of people who will come back and recommend you. And there is no, you can't buy this, right? So you have to be this, you have to experience this. So you have to be present, all right? So we all know of those uh, websites that haven't been updated for two years, and so we just assume that somebody is dead. I often find this with actors, right? Somebody told an actor two or three years ago, you have to have a blog. I'm not really sure why a particular actor needs a blog. They need a news site. But so they have a blog, and they blog for a month, and they don't blog anymore. So when you search their name, they appear like they're dead because they haven't updated it at all. So that was, that was like an, an inappropriate a, uh, engagement tool. Their better engagement tool is maybe a, a sort of like a news feed and a collection of where they appear in the news. Or just move on to an affiliate site like uh, IMDB, which has uh, a pro feature that you can update. So you look like you're alive because you're continually working. So being, uh, being present, um, being authentic, Authentic, um, there are people who believe that they can buy authenticity, especially through a marketing department, and that's not really true. We can't lie about you and make it stick. Oh, sure, we can make it stick for about a week, but it's not really going to stick for a long while. So we <laughs> at one time, Coca-Cola was actually sold as a health drink. All right, so they did have to pivot eventually, didn't they? <laughs> we discovered it is not indeed a uh, health drink. Uh, and then also to be responsive. So I see this all the time on Facebook and, and Twitter and uh, even in blogs. Somebody asks a question and it is never answered. So if you want to engage with this community, and I, and I often find this with restaurants, we've really got to kick those guys in the pants. If somebody says, that really tasted good, where do your onions come from? You need to respond. And here's what happens, especially with um, small businesses, but it, it is, I've recently observed it in these medium-sized businesses, even enterprise businesses. They won't let go of who is going to respond to this because they're really frightened of a scandal. Like you're going to say, well, it, it was a Vidalia onions and I hate red onions and I hate all farmers who farm with red onions. And some, like, some little intern is going to, to do that to you. So it's really about um, delegating it so that it can be responded to, um, setting up your um, auto responses or your alerts. Or, or Those are really, really important to building your audience and building your brand. A lot of people say, well, great, I spent all this money on my imagery and my logos for Facebook, but I have nobody who responds when somebody asks a question. All right, all right uh, very last minute, uh, just write, okay? If you're gonna just write, just take a photo, just post it, just get it done, all right? Because 
nobody's watching right now. All right, unless maybe, maybe if you're Nicolas Cage, okay, you might want to filter between you, but um, just get it done. And as you start to build content, people respond to the content and then you respond to their responses. So uh, most often, I feel like I go back to um, high school English teacher mode. I've been a reporter for a small town newspaper in uh, Michigan. I've uh, done documentation for software. Uh, I've been, um, high school English teacher, uh, I blog for business now, and it all comes back down to um, I plan to write, I have great ideas to write, but I don't write because I have an internal editor. And uh, the truth is, is to write, to post, to photograph, um, just start to get it done, all right? You've got to start somewhere or restart. Um, uh, don't, don't let people think that your, your brand or your um, or your company is, is dead. <laughs>